Greetings, fellow scholars. Today, we will be discussing the Bible. Now, before we actually get started with this discussion, it's worth noting that this will be a more secular, non-religious perspective on the Bible. It is intended for people who are interested in learning about the Bible, but are not particularly religious. Not necessarily. In this video, we will be looking at Genesis, the first book in the Bible. Now, expect a more left-leaning, progressive take on the Bible. And also, for those who are interested, all the quotations and the actual reading come from the New King James Version of the Bible, if you're looking for specific translations. Let us begin. The first book of Moses, called Genesis. And this means the first book that Moses supposedly wrote, and not the first book in the Genesis series or something. Anyway. Chapter 1. This is pretty much just the creation. It's probably one of the most famous parts of the Bible. He made the heavens and the earth, and then all that other jazz. So that's all I'm going to say on that. Chapter 2. This is where we see the Garden of Eden, the Tree of Life, and the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil. God places Adam in the garden to watch over it, and then has him name all the animals. This gives him dominion over them, showing that he is superior to them. So within the first few pages of the Bible, we're told that man is superior to the animals, and this is the basis of an anthropocentric mindset that we still hold. God said we're better than non-human animals, and so we are. Then God wants to give Adam a helper comparable to him. Verse 18. This implies that women are meant to be helpers to men, therefore subservient. The use of a word like comparable does not mean equal. In addition, Eve, who stands in for all women, is made out of one of Adam's ribs. And if Adam represents all men, then women are of men. And to create something is to be above it. So, we've so far reinforced human animals above non-human animals and men above women. And it's only chapter 2 of 50 of the first book. Chapter 3. The serpent convinces Eve to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And when the couple eat this fruit, they realize they're naked because they now have knowledge. And so God punishes them. God punishes them for acquiring knowledge. He wants them ignorant and stupid. Also, it's the woman that tempts the man. This is a long-running literary theme and a further means of reinforcing right from the beginning that man is superior to woman, but that woman will attempt to bring men down to their level. So, what are God's punishments for this whole ordeal? Number one, the serpent must slither on his belly for all time. He is a snake though. So, okay. Number two, women are going to have pain in childbirth and they will be ruled over by their husbands. Here's an exact quote. And he shall rule over you. Verse 16. Number three, men will toil the field, meaning men will have to work. Now, in contemporary society, these things don't even exist anymore if you go by contemporary trends. Men aren't the only ones that work, so women now also have to toil the metaphorical field. Furthermore, women don't necessarily have much pain in childbirth anymore. You get some pretty badass drugs nowadays, like epidurals. Not to mention a caesarean section, which is a surgery that can use general anesthetic, which means no pain during the delivery. The snake is still punished though. God then tells them to leave the garden because otherwise they might eat from the tree of life and live forever. And we can't have that. Chapter 4. Cain kills Abel because Abel's offering of sheep as a sacrifice is better than Cain's sacrifice of vegetables. So, Cain's sacrifice, which doesn't require the meaningless death of an animal, is considered worse than Abel's sacrifice that requires killing a defenseless animal. This further reinforces the anthropocentric nature of meat eating. It's seen as superior to kill an animal and not to work hard on a farm to create non-cruel foodstuffs. Also, God is seemingly harsh to Cain for no real reason. 
he then punishes him, and makes sure that no one will kill him. Cain goes off with his wife and has kids. They form a city in the land of Nod, and he names the city after his son Enoch. Meanwhile, Adam and Eve get busy and have another kid. His name is Seth, and he also has kids. Chapter 5 This is just a genealogical account of Adam's family and offspring. Fair warning, there are some parts of this book that amount to little more than a list of names of children, and their children, and their children, and so on. Basically, it's a family tree in writing. According to this genealogical account, they all lived hundreds of years ago. And at some point, we need to note that the idea of a human living hundreds of years is ridiculous. Humans generally live less than a century, but it's common to mythologize mythical characters in this fashion and to make it that they somehow lasted hundreds of years. Chapter 6. Humans grew plentiful, and so God made that they'd only last 120 years. So I guess the writers of this book were prepared for people calling bullshit on that last chapter. This is also where humanity is perceived as becoming increasingly wicked and violent. However, our main boy Noah was cool with God, and so God told him to make an ark. He gives him directions, and says he'll send animals to him to care for in the ark. Chapter 7. After saying that God will send two of each animal, God now says it's going to be seven each of every clean animal, a male and female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female, also seven each of birds in the air. That's uh, verses two to three. So it's not two of each, as it just said. Anyway, this has always been a bit confusing, but there were more than just the two, except for unclean animals. I have no idea why this story is only remembered as having two of each. But anyway, seven days later, God floods the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. The flood rose above the mountains and everything drowned to death, including all the innocent animals that didn't get a ticket to go on the ark. This is apparently a merciful solution to the problem of wickedness. Just murder everything and start again. Cool. Chapter 8. Every seven days, Noah goes out with a dove to see if he'd find a place to perch which was an old Viking tactic for finding land. And he also sent out a raven. But the raven isn't mentioned again for some reason. Once it's safe, God tells them they can go. So they head off. And God tells them he won't destroy everything again like he just did. It's God's covenant with his creation. The first of several covenants. Chapter 9. God tells them that they can now eat any animal they want, but they must not shed the blood of humans. So no murder. God, as a sign of his covenant, put a rainbow in the sky. It's meant to symbolize him never murdering the entire species again. And seeing as a rainbow comes after rain, it's probably to emphasize that he could have murdered us with every bit of rainfall, but hasn't. A bit later, Noah gets drunk one day and prances around naked and then decides to curse Canaan because Canaan didn't cover him with a blanket. This is a great family. Chapter 10. This is just another genealogical chapter that shows the descendants of Noah. Chapter 11. Everyone could speak the same language and then decided to make a city with a tower that would reach heaven. However, this Tower of Babel was a bad thing in God's eyes and so he made them all have different languages so they couldn't organize anymore. So once again, there is a depiction of a designed desire for human ignorance. You can only know what you have been permitted to know and do not try to understand more of the world, naughty knowledge seekers. Then there's more genealogies, this time of Shem and Terah's descendants. The genealogical stuff has nothing of interest in it because it's literally just a list of random names. It's like this one section in Rabelais' Gargantua where it's just a list of random words for no real reason. Pointless. Chapter 12. God chats to Abram and tells him to go to a place that will be a good nation. Essentially, he sends Abram to a promised land. So Abram goes to Canaan, the place, not the person, with his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot. They go together to this promised land. On the way, they go to Egypt, have a kerfuffle with the pharaoh there because Sarai is hot. And so they pretend she's Abram's sister and eventually they get out of there. It seems like a bit of a pointless interlude to his journey to Canaan, but don't worry, this plot point comes up again. Chapter 13. The family sets up shop, but for some reason, Abram and Lot can't 
both live there because they have too much stuff. So they separate. Lot goes to Jordan near Sodom and Abram gets to keep Canaan. All was good and chill for him. But for Lot, well, he was living next to Sodom. So you know things are going to get bad because this is the Sodom, as in Sodom and Gomorrah. Chapter 14. What do you know? Things got bad. This chapter starts mostly with just some political stuff about Sodom and Gomorrah and other places. Some war stuff. But then Lot gets kidnapped and his stuff gets taken. So Abram gathers his people and they attack. They reclaim Lot and his stuff. Abram meets with the king of Sodom and refuses to take anything even though this is customary in war. You see, because the Lord is on his side. Chapter 15. Abram is sad because he has no kids. But God reassures him that he'll have as many descendants as there are stars in the sky. However, you can say this about anyone who has kids. Because over a protracted period of time, your descendants will always be numerous. It's basic exponential maths. But let's move on. He then goes and brings out a heifer, a goat, a ram, a turtle dove, and a pigeon and murders them all in a ritual sacrifice. Then he chases away the vultures because he's adamant that these carcasses go to absolute waste. Cool. In a dream, God tells him the future of his people. This prophecy doesn't sound so great. Also, God knows exactly what will happen, and so does free will even exist. There are usually claims that God gave us free will, but he knows everything that will happen, so you know, this is a discussion for another time. Chapter 16. Sarai can't get pregnant. So Abram knocks up her servant, Hagar, instead. But uh, God gave him the go-ahead, so it's all fine. Hagar has a baby named Ishmael. Chapter 17. God makes a covenant with Abram, who he renames Abraham because he's going to be the father of nations and kings. This is a great way of setting up a race of people who are superior to every other race. Fun! The beginnings of racial supremacy. Anyway, back to this covenant with God. To maintain this covenant, Abraham and his descendants would have to be circumcised. God also renames Sarai to Sarah and says she'll now have kids and that their child will be Isaac. However, Abraham's other child, Ishmael, will also be a father of nations. So that's nice. Then Abraham goes and circumcises everyone, hopefully with consent. Chapter 18. Abraham is visited by three men who are emissaries of God, perhaps angels. They say Sarah will have a child, but Sarah doesn't believe it because she's old and past her childbearing years. Then God decides it's time to destroy Sodom, and Abraham asks him to spare the good people in the city. And God says if he can find 50 good people in the city, he won't destroy it. Then Abraham kind of pushes him further and further down until God says he won't destroy the city, even if there are only 10 good people in the city. Chapter 19. Lot is in Sodom, if you remember him, and he invites the angelic visitors who God sent into his home. And then random people surround his house because they want to know them carnally. It's verse 5. This pretty much means that the residents of Sodom want to have sex with these angels. Sex of the non-consensual variety. I would just use the real word here, but YouTube has algorithms that detect things and then punish you. But then Lot says he'd rather send his virgin daughters out instead of his guests. Apparently, allowing your daughters to get sexually assaulted is a worthwhile trade-off in this instance. I just want to remind everyone that this book is considered a central work on Christian ethics and morality. Just putting that out there. But the visitors help Lot and blind these random people. Some real angelic work there. The angels tell Lot to grab his family and to leave the city without looking back. If they look back, bad stuff will happen. But of course, Lot's wife looks back and turns into a pillar of salt. And this is actually an instance where I think God didn't do that on purpose. Maybe angelic smiting power is like a hardcore magic and it can have some side effects. Anyway, the next day, everything is destroyed. Lot and his daughters go into the mountains, but there are no men around. So they get their dad drunk and then lay with him so they can continue his lineage. 
cool, fun, not creepy at all by modern standards. Chapter 20 This random Abimelech guy takes Abraham's wife and then Abraham claims she's his sister again and then Abimelech has a dream about her being Abraham's wife. It's really weird. So then he gives Abraham some stuff and returns Sarah. And then Abraham prays for him. And so Abimelech's wife and servants are now able to have kids. Because why not? Chapter 21. Sarah finally has her baby. It's Isaac. Sarah doesn't much like that Abraham had a kid with Hagar. And so Abraham casts them out. But at least gives them some water. How nice. They go out into the wilderness and she almost dies. But God intervenes and gives them water. Apparently, Ishmael, Hagar's son, is also meant to be the father of nations. There are so many fathers of nations in this book, which does make sense, I guess. Then Abraham makes a pact with Abimelech, who's still just some random guy that appeared out of nowhere and doesn't play much of a role in the overarching story. Chapter 22. God tells Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, his son, instead of the usual sacrifice, which would be something like a lamb. Isaac asks what's happening because he's probably terrified, but Abraham just binds him. Thankfully, God stops him. It was all a test of faith. Fun! Then there's a random ram that got caught in some thorns, and so Abraham goes to murder that instead, because it's better than murdering his son. Because animals don't much matter to these people. Then it randomly tells you about the family of Nahor. Uh, more genealogical stuff for seemingly no reason. Chapter 23. Sarah dies in a foreign land and Abraham makes a deal with some people to bury her there. All's good and she gets buried. Nothing really else to say there. Chapter 24. Abraham, who's old now, wants a wife for Isaac, but one who's from Abraham's native land. But he doesn't want Isaac to go there himself and instead sends a servant to find a wife for him. The servant goes to the city of Nahor. He asks God to bless his search. And that's when Rebecca appears. She's your usual Bible woman, virgin, beautiful, etc. She gives the servant and the camels water and offers lodging. They sit to eat and that's when the servant tells them about Abraham's plan. This section has the servant just repeat everything that was already said. A contemporary writer would just say that the servant just explained things. But nope, repetition is the name of the game here. The servant brings her back and then Isaac and Rebecca get married. Simple as that. Chapter 25. Abraham got a new wife after Sarah died, Kutora. They had loads of kids. And then Abraham dies. He gives everything he had to Isaac, but he also gave stuff to all of his concubines. It's worth noting that in this part of the Bible, there's no condemnation of polygamy. Abraham had multiple wives and concubines. After his death, it discusses the genealogy of Isaac and Ishmael. Then it goes on to discuss how Rebecca, Isaac's wife, was barren and God healed her and gave her twins. The twins were Esau and Jacob and during their upbringing, Esau crawls into Jacob's tent at one point and begs for food. But Jacob demands that he sells his birthright to Jacob or else all this lentil stew will be for me. Because apparently, Jacob was willing to watch his own brother die over inheritance. Fun stuff. Chapter 26 we get to, once again, have some more weird pretend she's your sister nonsense here. I mean, if it worked for Abraham, it'll work for Isaac. Isaac pulls this trick with Abimelech, who's the king of Palestine. And I don't know if it's the same Abimelech. That isn't very clear. Because Isaac needs to live there because of a famine. And so he then pretends his wife is his sister until the king realizes and tells all his people to leave them alone. It's just weird. I don't get this whole fake sister subplot thing. Anyway, let's move on. Isaac does really well in this new land, and so the citizens of Palestine become envious of him. They start badgering him, and so he buggers off and digs a bunch of wells that the Palestinians keep taking, until he eventually gets to keep a well. Cool. Then God comes along and helps him out, and that leads the Palestinians to come and make peace with him. The chapter ends with a brief statement about Esau taking two wives that were too difficult for Isaac and Rebekah to handle. Those damn kids. Chapter 27. Isaac is now old and blind, and so he tells his son Esau to go and hunt 
to cook the meat he hunts and to bring it to him so he can bless his son. But Rebecca hears this and gets Jacob, their other son, to go and fetch some meat so she can make the food Isaac likes. Then Jacob can be blessed instead of his brother. Some pretty clear favoritism there. Jacob is worried though because his brother is hairy whereas he's smooth skinned and so he's worried his father will notice and curse him instead of blessing him. But Rebecca's like, nah, the curse will be on me, so it's all good. Jacob does as he's told, and then Rebecca prepares the food, gives Jacob Esau's clothes, and fashions him makeshift goatskin armbands. So basically, Jacob puts on a hilarious disguise that can trick his blind father. This apparently fools Isaac, and Esau doesn't get his blessing. This legal system is seemingly easily destroyed by basic fraud, because after this, despite the deception, Isaac won't bless Esau and take away his blessing from Jacob. Better luck next time. Blessings come once and once alone, apparently. Rebecca then sends Jacob away for a while, so Esau will conveniently forget that his birthright and blessing were taken from him. This was probably a good call, because Old Testament people killed each other for seemingly no reason, and this is a pretty big reason. Chapter 28 Isaac tells Jacob to go to his uncle's place and to get one of his daughters as a wife, which would make that a cousin. Fun! Esau also, once again, gets a wife. And there's this whole thing about Isaac not wanting them marrying people from specific areas for whatever reason. Meanwhile, Jacob chills somewhere away from his no doubt angry brother and has a dream. The dream involves him going up a ladder to heaven. Once there, God tells him the land will eventually belong to him. This is just more promised land stuff. In addition, the rock Jacob used as a pillow was then dunked in oil and he then renamed the area Bethel. Okay. Chapter 29. Jacob is still on the run, and he goes to his uncle Laban's place. Here he meets Rachel, his cousin and future wife. He then waters the sheep and kisses Rachel. But luckily her dad says it's cool for him to stay there with them. It's awesome. And so Jacob works for his uncle for seven years, but there's some confusing deception about who he's marrying, and then he gets a second wife. Anyway, he gets to marry both Leah and Rachel. For some reason. Now... Rachel couldn't have kids, but she was Jacob's favorite. However, Leah has four kids and hopes Jacob would not love her instead, but he's still more into Rachel. Leah's kids are Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Chapter 30. Because Rachel couldn't have kids, she lets Jacob bang her maid, Bilhah. Rachel wants to have kids through her, in a sense. She has two kids, Dan and Nephtali. Then Leah, who's had her kids, remember, wants her maid, Zilpah, to bang Jacob too. She then has two kids, Gad and Asher. Leah's seemingly jealous of Jacob having kids with his sister wife's maid, and so her maid also needs the pregnancy treatment. This all reminds me of those harem anime because he is just like one of those weird, really boring harem anime protagonists who for some reason women fall head over heels for. Makes no sense. If this were a regular book, I'd just call it bad writing. So I'm just going to call it bad writing, and then let's move on. Then, Rachel wants some of Leah's kids' mandrake roots that they found, and so she has to bang Jacob now two. Well, okay, that gets him another child, Zebulun. Then, Rachel becomes unbarren, I guess, and has Joseph. The whole infertile angle is played somewhat frequently in the Bible, it seems. Now, this whole time, Jacob's been serving Laban, but he wants to leave now. So he makes an agreement with Laban to separate his and Laban's herds. He does something confusing with rods and ensures he gets all the good flock. It's really weird, but ultimately comes down to Jacob getting all the best livestock and leaving his uncle poor. Great way to treat an uncle, I guess. It's really weird, but then again, so is everything in this book. Chapter 31. Laban's kids aren't so happy that Jacob somehow managed to swindle their dad out of his flock, so then Jacob just kind of runs away. He's got what he needs, and so he runs. If this book is supposed to be teaching you morality... And so far, it's teaching you that if you screw over the people who take you in, you can do quite well for yourself. Anyway, 
Laban catches up to him and wants to know why he ran away. And he claims he did it because he thought Laban would take his wives and property from him. So he screwed someone over before they could screw him over. Well done. And Jacob gets angry because Laban is rightfully angry and wants his stuff back. Then Laban and Jacob make a covenant and they go their separate ways. So all's well that ends well. Chapter 32. Jacob goes home at last and sends word to his brother Esau, the one he screwed over decades ago with his father's blessing. And Esau decides to come and greet him with 400 men in tow. So Jacob is scared, rightly, and he sends a servant with gifts and also asks God to spare him. That night, he takes his wives and kids away from there and then randomly wrestles with an unnamed man until dawn. It's rather weird, which is a recurring pattern. This man is possibly God himself, and he renames Jacob Israel because he has struggled with both men and God. And ever since, the children of Israel don't eat from the hip sockets because that's where Jacob got injured, and apparently that's enough to not eat something. Chapter 33. Jacob and Esau meet, and instead of being angry, Esau seems pretty happy. He's done well without the blessing. Jacob is hesitant though, but they ultimately get to Canaan safely. Chapter 34. Sheshem, some guy, rapes Dine, Jacob's daughter, because he wants her as his wife. So that's great. He goes to Jacob's sons and asks for her to be his wife. Jacob's sons agree only if Sheshem and the rest of them all get circumcised to be like the Israelites. They agree and do it. Then... When they're recovering, Jacob's people go into the city and kill all the men. This is actually kind of badass, so all good. This is probably one of the coolest bits I've read thus far. Very, I spit on your grave. However, Jacob didn't authorize it and didn't like that they'd massacred a whole city and plundered it. He's pretty worried he'll be seen as a bad boy by all the other people who live around there. Chapter 35. Jacob is told to go to Bethel. And he has his people leave behind all their false gods and earrings. They also have to change their clothes. Guess it's a new place, new face kind of thing. No one attacks them as they go to Bethel. Probably because everyone is afraid of them seeing as they massacre the city. In other news, Rebecca's nurse dies here and is buried. Jacob now adopts the name Israel. And God tells them to be fruitful and multiply. Rachel then dies in childbirth, giving birth to Benjamin. And now Jacob has his 12 sons. And then Isaac dies, and his sons bury him. Chapter 36. This is just the genealogy of Esau. It's another of those chapters. Chapter 37. Joseph, Jacob slash Israel's kid, was his father's favorite. And so his brothers hated him for it. He's also got a special tunic made of many colors. Anyone familiar with Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat will know this plot. He then has a dream in which the others bow down to him, and this angers them even more. Apparently, he just can't feel their animosity towards him. Maybe he's not a people person. So when he goes to meet them, they strip off his clothes and throw him in a pit. They decide against killing him and instead just sell him to the Ishmaelites. And for those who are curious, no, I did not mispronounce Israelites. This is another group with a very similar name. Then, after selling him, They kill a defenseless animal and cover the colorful tunic in its blood to disguise what they've done. And because Jacob thinks his son is dead, he mourns him. Chapter 38. Judah, another of Jacob's sons, eventually leaves on his own. He meets a woman named Shua and has some kids. The first one's name is Ur, then Anan, and then Sheila, which is apparently a man's name. Ur was meant to marry Tamar, but God didn't like him, so he died. Then Judah orders Anan to have a child with Tamar, but he didn't want to and instead just ejaculated on the ground, as you do, but God didn't like that, so he killed him too. And so Judah, after two of his sons have died, tells Tamar that she can stay there till his third son is grown. She waits around and eventually, when he's grown, she gets out of her widow's clothes and instead into a fun veil. Judah doesn't realize it's her, and he asks her, please let me come into you, verse 16, and yes, This is a direct quote, which I presume just meant have sex, but I prefer it to be modern slang that the authors of the Bible slid in there because they were prescient. He does this because he doesn't realize it's her. Apparently, a single veil is enough to fool a man, that damn harlot. 
When he finds Artemar is pregnant, he wants to have her killed, but then discovers it's his child, and so he's like, nah, it's fine, I want to come in you again. So they did. They have two kids, Perez and Zera. Chapter 39. Back to Joseph. The son of Isaac was bought by an Egyptian who slowly promoted Joseph until he was the head of the house. Apparently, God was on his side, and so everything he did was good. But he didn't want to save him from slavery. But that's all part of the divine plan, as we'll see. His master's wife wanted him bad, though, but he kept refusing her. Until at last, the temptress decided she'd had enough and accused Joseph. So Joseph got thrown in prison. However... God was still with him, and so, despite being in prison, he somehow won the favor of the warden, because, as we've said, God was just with him all the time. Chapter 40. The Pharaoh throws some of his servants in prison because he was angry with them, so they wound up under Joseph's charge. The two servants, the Pharaoh's chief butler and baker, have dreams, and Joseph interprets them. According to him, the butler will be restored to his place as the Pharaoh's servant and the baker will be hanged. And this comes to pass. But the butler forgets about it and carries on with his life. Chapter 41. The Pharaoh has a dream and no one can interpret it. And that's when the butler remembers Joseph and tells the Pharaoh about Joseph's ability. The Pharaoh sends for Joseph as a dream interpreter. According to Joseph, the Pharaoh's dream prophesies seven good years of harvest and seven years of famine that will follow it. So the Pharaoh needs to collect grain during the plentiful time and then they'll be able to survive the famine that is to come. For the dope advice, the pharaoh makes Joseph his second-in-command, gives him a wife, Azanath, and renames him Zaphnath Pania. During the time of plenty, he has two kids, Manasseh and Ephraim. The famine then hits, and it hits hard. And it hits more than just Egypt. It hits the whole damn place. So people come from all over to get grain, which has been cleverly stored from Egypt. Chapter 42 Ten of Joseph's brothers then come to Egypt because there's a famine. They arrive and don't recognize the brother they sold. Joseph recognizes them, though, and calls them spies. He keeps one prisoner, and the rest go back to get the only brother that didn't come with them the first time. That's what Joseph wants, and he's got the grain, so they listen. The brothers go home with the grain they've been given, and they also still have their money. Joseph didn't take it, and they meet their father. He isn't too happy about this arrangement, but they want their brother back, so let's go back. Chapter 43. The grain Joseph had given them was running out, and so Israel slash Jacob sends them back with all sorts of gifts and such. They also go back with Benjamin, the youngest brother. Joseph has his servants prepare a meal for his brothers, and he questions them. Chapter 44. Joseph has his grain bags filled and also gives them their money back, and then also places a cup in Benjamin's bag. He sends his brothers off and then sends a servant after them to accuse him of theft. The cup is found in Benjamin's bag and so Joseph demands him as a slave. Judah tries to plead with Joseph. He doesn't want Benjamin to go because then Israel slash Jacob will surely die of sadness. Chapter 45. With things heating up, Joseph finally tells them who he is and that it's actually fine that they sold him into slavery because God was just playing the long game. And he ultimately did it because the whole famine thing was definitely coming. So it's all predetermined. Yay! There is no free will! The brothers go back to fetch their father and are going to move to Egypt. Yay! Also, Jacob slash Israel, which the book continuously changes around, and so I just use both names, is going to come see his long-lost son once more before kicking the bucket. Chapter 46. Jacob slash Israel heads to Egypt. This chapter then does that old genealogy thing again. After that, Joseph sets things up and all is fine, I guess. Chapter 47. Jacob slash Israel meets the Pharaoh, blesses him, and then goes off to settle down in this new land. Now we get to some fun stuff. Joseph decides to increase the power of the Pharaoh by doing a few fun things. First, he gets all the desperate people's money in exchange for grain. When they have no money left, they give away their livestock. And when he takes that away, they give their land to him. And so Joseph successfully turns the pharaoh into a proper monarch through manipulation of a natural disaster. The pharaoh now has all the land, and from now on, they have to give him a portion of all food as a tax. Well done, Joseph. You invented some feudalism. Chapter 48. Jacob slash Israel 
blesses Joseph's sons. He blesses the younger kid more, which pretty much relates to how Joseph is not the first son, but he is the favorite. So there's cyclical narratives in something that's supposedly true. Dope. Chapter 49. Jacob slash Israel's final words to his sons is a combination of niceties and kind of mean stuff. He then dies. Chapter 50. Joseph gets the Pharaoh's permission to bury his dad. So he leaves to do that. It's pretty much like a big royal procession. So that's nice. Jacob slash Israel gets buried in Canaan. With dad dead, the sons of Jacob slash Israel become worried that Joseph will, rightly, be angry with them. But he forgives them, kind of like a proto-Christ figure. Eventually, Joseph also dies. And that marks the end of Genesis. Conclusion Well, that was fun. You now know what happened in Genesis. And as you now know, the Bible is a very moral book. Join us next time for Exodus. When I get around to it.